Hi, I'm Richard Lang and this is my friend Jaime Wise that I've known for many years. And uh, we're going to chat about seeing and uh, how you came to it and how it's affected your life. Mm. Welcome. I hope you enjoy the chat. <laughs> so, uh, what led you to the Headless Way, Jaime? Well, it all began when I was a child, actually, over in Connemara. Mm. We used to go on holidays, and uh, I saw the men going out in Carrick, which is a, a bush, and they just go out with the tide. And I would, well, really wanted to go with them, so I asked one day, could I, could I come? We, we were speaking Gaelic at the time, because they didn't speak uh, English. And You were just a young was, boy. I was just a young kid of 11. Mm. So he said, OK, the day after tomorrow, Mm. Uh, we'll go. And I didn't say anything to my mother, just say, we're playing down on the strand. And in those days, in the late 40s, you could play anywhere and all day, and uh, my mother wasn't anxious about it. Mm. So off we went, and we went out into it. It was a, an August day, about August the 14th, I think. And uh, it was a very dull day. The, the leaden sky, and the sea was, the sea was quite calm. And I just remember going out, we went out at great speed with the tide and then the, the boat slowed down and I can't remember us talking in the boat funnily enough, but I remember sitting, I don't remember eating anything, but about sometime in the afternoon, the father who was sitting in the middle of the boat, probably much younger than I am now, but he looked a very old man to mm. me, he looked into the sea and said, the, 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 the sea is turning and the two sons hauled in this fantastic net full of fish. But they were all, all the fish were kind of dying. And kind of, and I didn't like the things at all. So I kind of, oh my God, that's horrible. And I looked up at the sky, and it was leaden, and my eye ran down along the sky, down onto the horizon, boom, and ran along the sea, right up to the boat, and up to this, this place here. Mm. And I don't think I had any words at that time, but what happened was I saw the unity of everything, mm. the sky, the sea, mm. the boat, the fish, the men came whoop, up here. Now, years later, I would say, it was the moment I stopped thinking. Mm. And just look. And just, as Wittgenstein says, don't think, just look. Mm. That was the moment I, boom, I looked and saw. Mm. And it was an amazing experience. Mm. Then I came home. <laughs> I mean, eventually we were brought in, the, and my mother said, where were we? I said, just playing on the strand. And she didn't. She said, well, tea will be ready. There's, there's, we were in Kaimur Abbey Castle we were staying in, and she said, supper will be ready about seven. Go up and wash yourself. And I said, yeah, grand. And I never spoke about it hmm. for years, but it kept, remained with me, the experience. Hmm. And when in school, and I, I liked school, I wasn't a kind of a swat, but I, I just, I was interested in learning. Mm. And when we'd read poetry, and I always loved poetry, and when we'd read Wordsworth and he saw into the light of things, I'd say, I know what that is. I know, yes. I've been there. That, that's, or um, Milton on his blindness, you know, like as the waves make towards the pebble shore, so the minutes hasten to their end. Yes. Or Jerry Manley Hopkins, uh, one of my favourite poets, even, even as a schoolboy. Mm. And... Uh, it was the kind of echoes, and these men know what they're talking about. Mm. And then I was in a, a Jesuit school for 10 years, from when I was 7 to 17, and um, I joined the Jesuits in 1956. Why? And I, my, at the back of my mind was, I wouldn't say, I, I, I have time to explore that experience. Huh. I mean, it was, it was as definite as that. Mm. So I went in and we started off. I was looking around to see, did anyone else, anyone around here, know, have, have they had similar experiences? I used to have conversation because we used to go for walks as novices with threes and I was kind of very gently sifting out, you know, God, and, well, did you ever have, you know, did you ever any, any interesting experience? And people say, what? No, we had to say the rosary at home or go to Mass or something. You know? No one knew what you were talking about. No. And then we did the part of the, the training in, in the novice we do a 30-day retreat, and it's divided into the four weeks of the exercise. And the third week is devoted to the Passion of Christ. 
and we were told to get up at, we were up at 12 o'clock at night and we were down in the chapel, a beautiful chapel in the middle of Port Ireland, St. Emo in Port Ireland, a beautiful chapel. And we were sitting there and our, the novice master said, and now we're doing contemplation of the agony in the garden. And he said, imagine this scene, it's, you're kind of looking into this garden and you hear a man crying. And this man is God, it's God in his agony. And just contemplate that. And then he left and we were sitting there, 50 of us, in silence. And I was, I was contemplating the man in my mind's eye. I mean, I wasn't having visions in my mind's eye. And for the first time ever in my life, I became aware of my breathing. Mm. I mean, it sounds a bit ridiculous. I was 18 years of age, but I became aware of my breathing. And somehow it was extraordinarily connected with this man. And as I was looking at him in my mind's eye, his breathing and my breathing were one. Mm. And I couldn't distinguish between where his breathing ended and my breathing. It was a, 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 a really deep, deep, deep experience. Mm. Now, the, the rule was during the long retreat, you had to go to the novice master every day and tell him how he got on. So I went in and I decided, I'm going to break the silence. I'll tell him about this. And maybe, you know, he could make, because he's the novice master, he should know everything. And little did I know. But anyway, you know, we were very young and foolish. <laughs> <laughs> so I went in and he was, I was a long list to be a crowd behind me. And I said, he said, how, are you sleeping? Well, yes. And I said, I'd like to talk about an experience. And immediately his fingers began to drum on the table. And I said, when I was 11, I had this amazing experience. I've never told anyone about it. I saw the unity of things. And then I said, something last night in, in the church, something happened. And it was, but this time it was more the unity between Christ and myself, and myself and Christ. And he kind of cleared his throat and he said, um, I think, get, get more sleep. Next! And I went out, and I really was, that was a kind of a very low moment. Mm. Because I, I made a silly decision, or my ego made a, a silly decision. Don't talk about things that really mean a lot to you. Mm. People aren't interested. Mm. And I kind of cut myself off. And then I went through the novelship, took vows, came up to the university, went through the university. And even in the university, I was always searching for. And I was kind of trying to sift out, does anyone know anything? Or, or what was that experience? It was, it was, it was really something very, very fascinating. It, it, it never left me. It's never left me. That scene has never no. left me. That was 63 years ago. Um, and then I went on, after the university, I went on to do philosophy. And I thought philosophy may open up something. But I didn't like the philosophy. Uh, I found it incredibly boring. Mm -hmm. And we were just rote learning and filling our minds up with stuff. And I was saying, this... I didn't say it to anyone, because, I mean, you wouldn't be very popular. This is completely not a waste of time. Mm. And the only person I found any kind of solace in was Kierkegaard. I, was, I went in one day into Munich, it was, and I, I saw this little book. I had, I had no money, because as a, as, a novel, as, a, as a student, you have no money. But I had a few uh, marks. There was this book in the second-hand bookstore called The Individual and His God. It was a beautiful book. I still have it earmarked and I read that and I said this is he this man knows something this man has had this experience mm. he knows what he's talking about mm. there's a ring of truth mm. so then um, time passed and I found myself teaching in the Minster Centre mm. and I had a student called Richard Lang psychotherapy training centre psychotherapy yeah and one day after a, 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 a lecture I gave uh, he came up to me, this man who was sitting over opposite me now, and said, that's interesting what you're talking about. This man is talking about similar things. And handed me a book with Zen and the Rediscovery of the Obvious. And I looked at it. Oh, no, not having no head. Not having, having, no head. having no head. And I took it. And I went back and I, I started to read it. And it didn't, immediately didn't touch me at all. And then about two years later, I'm, I'm telescoping, two years later I was down in, in um, Cambridge with Jill, my wife, and I went into the second-hand bookstore and I saw this book, The Hierarchy of Heaven and Earth, a blue copy, and I took it out and I read the introduction. The introduction was 
said, mentioned that C.S. Lewis had regarded this, and I have always loved C.S. Lewis as a work of genius. I said, wait a minute, that, this name rings a bell. If C.S. Lewis says he's a genius, I'm going to study. I'm going to. So the very minute I started to study, re, I mean reading them seriously, and kind of experiencing it as I was reading it, I mean getting the things very, yeah. very clearly, because yeah. it was a... Just like that. Yeah. Yes, I know that. Yes, yeah, that was that experience. Yes, yeah, that was that experience. How wonderful. And then you had left, but I still had this book, and I really wanted to give it back to you, but you, I tried to get your address, but you changed your addresses. And then one day I walked in, and there you were washing up a cup. And I said, Richard, I still have your book. and It's fantastic. I love it. And you said, this Saturday I'm going up to see Douglas. Would you like to come? I said, I have to check with Jill, my wife, which I did. And then we drove up. And on the way up, I don't know if you recall this, you said, you're, you're rather quiet, I mean. And I was saying, yeah, what would happen if this man turns around, this man who really I regard as an incredible genius, and said, you're a fake. That was you my were ego. nervous I, about that. You I was were... very, very nervous. Yes. But then I went into the house, and I met this, and at the very minute I came into his presence, I mean, it was instant, like the transfiguration. This man sees, this man knows. And that was... And he didn't of... point the finger, he embraced you. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And then we sat talking and, and uh, I knew immediately. And then very shortly afterwards, we started exchanging letters, which I uh, have some, I, mean, I think most of them. Mm. And I, I wrote a, um, a thing about the spiritual exercises, exercise with St. Ignatius, mm. or experiment mm. with Douglas. And he sent me back some beautiful letters about it mm. and said, yes, you're coming from a tradition which I honour, and you, you know, this is, this is what, continue to explore what you're exploring. And, you know, very, very humbly said, mm. you know, and this will be a, an assistance. Respecting you. So, I know you kept in touch with Douglas. Mm. Um, how do you think it has affected your life oh, now? Every way. I mean, it's like how necessary is breathing. Mm. I mean, mm. I mean, my, all my work as a therapist, and I, I, I trained as a craniosacral therapist, uh, is done through the medium of of Douglas. It's it's I've kind of I haven't changed it, but I've I've acclimatized the thing to to um, talking to people and. Some people come and I, I, I get the mirror in and I ask them, are you the one in the mirror or the one who looks into the mirror? And what's the difference? Of course, every morning I look in the mirror, I see this old man looking out. I say, the poor devil. Thank God I'm not yeah, like wow. that. <laughs> so you stay there, mate, you know, don't. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, no, I mean, it is the most amazing experience of my life. I mean, no, no words could could explain, but it's just, it's, and it's so beautiful and so simple. Mm. I mean, that's, that's what, what convinces me. I think all belief has to be true, or all knowledge, because it's very important. You know something, after meeting Dave, uh, um, Douglas and after the, my own experience, I knew something with every fiber of my being. Mm. It's not so much a matter of belief. Because no. I mean, when you look around the world, belief, belief, people believe and believe and they, they slit each other's throats because of belief. But if you know, mm. it's something really amazing. Mm. Really, really amazing. Mm. And, it's, I mean, and it's given, I think this is, this is given to each one of us to share. I mean, it's, it's there for sharing. You couldn't hold this on as you could, you know, we're Catholics or we're Protestants or we're Jews or we're whatever we are. I mean, that's ridiculous. Mm. When I do this and point back to this nothingness, this emptiness, that contains everything. I mean, every time it's fresh. Mm. I mean, that is the amazing. Mm. And this is what convinced me, if I needed con conviction, mm. that this is something this is the treasure hidden in the field. Mm. This is the pearl of great price. Mm. Thank you, Jaime. <laughs> A delight yeah. to spend time with you. Yeah. yeah. And with you. And thank you for introducing me. <laughs> that was a very, very important yes. moment. Yeah.